Church has always been a vital part of every believer's life. Hello, I'm Pastor Gray, pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Longview, Texas. Thank you for taking the time to tune in for this service. I'm standing in our auditorium, and here in just a moment, I'm going to take you into this auditorium as we are conducting the services here at 2200 West Loop 281. My heart's desire is that as the Word of God is preached, that God would do something during this service. Again, thank you for being with us. Enjoy the services. I'll be back at the end. God bless you. Take your Bibles and go to the book of Luke, if you will. Luke chapter 18, and to our guests, thank you for being here, and we appreciate that, uh, that you're here, and uh, make sure that you let everybody we know that we said hello, and you better give Brother Buchanan a kiss on the cheek for me. Amen. Uh, so uh, Luke chapter 18 and verse number 9. Before we read the parable here and this of the Lord is giving here in Luke chapter 18, I, I want to make a statement. That way it kind of helps us as we read it. The primary teaching of this parable is salvation. The primary application this morning is to those of us who are saved not to become a snob or a Pharisee with our salvation. Can, can I say that again? The parable we're about to read primarily is talking about salvation. You and I are not good enough to get saved. We do not come before the Lord touting our goodness, thinking that it takes us up to save us from our righteousness. Because we have no righteousness. But that, that sub-application into who we are is this. With this wonderful gift of salvation, we cannot and we should not think that we are superior to anyone else around us. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, we are sinners saved by grace. And that this grace that was given to us was not purchased with our righteousness. It was not purchased with our goodness. It was not purchased with anything we have. It was purchased by the shed blood of Jesus Christ who died on the old rugged cross. And anytime you meet a believer who walks with pride and walks with this snobbish superior attitude, they truly have forgotten why the Lord saved them. It was not because of you and I. So let's read it with that in mind. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Luke 18, 9. Two men went up into the temple to pray, Luke 18, verse 10. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much of his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you. This is Jesus. I tell you. This man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. From the moment that we trusted Christ, we became the child of God. I cannot say this enough, and I do not think it's, it's trite to say it again. The moment you believed that Jesus was enough for your eternity was the moment he saved you. He is not waiting to see how you turn out. He already knows how it's going to turn out. You're going to heaven. And that's based on belief. So from the moment we trust Christ, in the moment we now possess the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, the Holy Spirit of God lives on the inside of everyone who is his child. Could, could you this morning raise your hand and say, Pastor, I remember the day like Brother Tal that I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Can you raise your hand? At that moment, sealed on the inside of you is a power. Y'all listen to this, a power unlike any other power that has ever existed exists 
right now on the inside of who you are. Right now on the inside of me is a power. And there are some times when that power of God, when the power of God begins to work, then the power of God begins to clean up your outside. It begins to transform the outside of you to match who you are on the inside. Y'all listen, you're not getting better from the inside out. Can I tell you something? The God that lives on the inside is trying to conform the outside of you to who you already are on the inside. You became a child of God. Living on the inside of you is the image of the Holy One, and now He just wants the outside to reflect who you already and have always been from the moment of salvation on the inside. But just like happens to everybody at a point in their life when the Lord starts working and the blessings start coming, and by the way, every blessing you have is not because of your mind or your intellect. Any blessing you have is because you're a child of God. Did y'all hear that? You're a child of God. And there's many times that what starts to begin happening to us is this. When God starts doing in us, then the flesh loves success. The flesh loves it when it scores the touchdown. The flesh loves it when it's bottom of the ninth and you hit a home run to win the game. The flesh loves it when you hit that last second shot. I get a kick out of when I watch our young people play ball on the court and especially when I've had the opportunity to watch their daddies play ball when they were that age and and I'm going to kind of go after Peyton Thomas right now and Peyton kind of kind of man he hit a three-pointer uh, this last time and, and he rare back and shot that thing he's going down the court and he is like airplane in it he hit a shot and he's like airplane and, I, and I'm like I've seen your daddy do that when he was your age there is something about who we are that is like, yes, I did it. And there's some things that you celebrate about that you know it may never happen again. So somebody take a picture right now because this is my time. That's one thing. And it's one thing to joy and to clap and to say, good night, God's been good. But oh, it's another thing. When the blessings of God make you pull out your ladder and you climb that ladder and think, I am superior to everybody around me. Can, can I preach this morning on this subject? Salvation does not make you superior. Salvation does not make you superior. Oh, when we start believing that we are better than the publicans, when we start believing that we rank better than the people around us, this is the pride. This is the problem with Christianity at some times. And I'm here just to tell you, stay humble with your salvation. Stay humble with the fact that when the Lord saved you, He didn't save you from your goodness. He saved you from your sin nature. He saved you from everything you could be. And the parable we find here is primarily about salvation. But secondarily, the application is this. He saved us not because we were worthy of it and not because we were good, but because God is great. They assumed that because of their accomplishments that they were in a better standing than the poor publican. A businessman well known for his ruthlessness once announced to the writer Mark Twain, quote, before I die, I mean to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I will climb Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments aloud at the top. Mark Twain said this, I have a better idea. You could stay in Boston and keep them. There is something about us that we think after salvation that we have cornered the market on righteousness. Something happens to our flesh. We assume that because we do spiritual acts, that that makes us better than those who do not do these. 
We think because we go to church as our way to church that when we pass people not going to church, it's like, ha, 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 look at me. I'm better than that guy. And if on your journey to church this morning, if you pass somebody and you even had a fleeting thought, I'm better, then this sermon is for you. If you looked at somebody that was in a drunken stupor and you thought to yourself, ha, I'm better than them, then this sermon is for you. Because salvation does not make you superior to the mankind around you. Salvation makes you blessed. Salvation makes you blessed. There are two men found in the text. Would you look at it? The first is a Pharisee. Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee. The other a publican. The Pharisee. Would you look at his pride? Verse 11. I thank thee that I am not as other men are. You know, it is possible for you to be a saved Pharisee. It is possible for you to be a redeemed snob. It is possible for you to be a born-again bigot. It is possible for you to be that person that you think because God blessed you and God convicted. It's okay if I preach this way. God has given you blessings beyond compare. Let me tell you something, second generation Christian. I too am a second generation Christian, but I didn't do anything to become a second generation Christian. And just because I was born into a family that had God at the forefront of who they are does not mean I am better than anybody else around me. Oh, but listen to me, the pride, I thank thee. Look at the pride. Look at verse number 12. Look at his self-promotion. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. When you start hearing yourself talk about your spiritual accomplishments or what you do, then you, what you're telling everybody around is, I now am the litmus test and I now am the standard for Christianity. There's only one standard for Christianity, and that is Christ. And there's only one thing you can claim is that you were smart enough at the day that the gospel was presented that you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. Because if it wasn't for that day that grace appeared to you, you'd be on your way to hell. Thank God you were awake the day salvation showed up. Praise God you were in your right mind the day that somebody said you need Christ. Praise God you weren't asleep. The Pharisee, look at it. Primarily, this is about salvation, but oh, it is a trap that saved people can fall into. We can fall into the pride. We can fall into the promotion and then look at his prayer. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men. It is very easy to take a self-pride when we look at the people around us. As I came to church this morning, I went back and picked up Kelly and RG, and, and uh, we were riding to church today, and when we got down about Highway 80, I had to look away because of somebody that was walking down Highway 80, and they weren't dressed appropriately, and I, and I had to look away. And I thought to myself, she needs Jesus, just like I needed Jesus. And there's sometimes we can look at those around us and we offer this pharisaical prayer if we're not careful. Lord, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. Well, can I tell you something? If you were born in that family, and you had never heard Christ, and nobody ever invested in you, you would be just like them. And there must be something that we have in our life that we do not live a saved life with a pharisaical attitude. Did y'all hear that? We cannot live life as a pharisaical attitude or we are no good. But I want to live life with a publican attitude of this. Look what it says there in verse number 10. The, the two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. There are several things about this publican. Look at it. He stood with his head down. 
Look at, look at Luke 18, 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Let, let me have a conversation with you. And let me get 10 minutes into a conversation. And you will tell about me and I will tell about you what kind of saved person we are. If we are a Pharisee, we will quickly start cutting apart people that we are better look at what i do we'll promote our own goodness but oh there ought to be a conversation with us that some point in the conversation the publican attitude about our salvation comes out and that is this i am so unworthy of salvation and who am i and when that starts to happen look at it there was the posture look at his pride look look at it these atrocious people that he was lumped with. Luke 18, 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. <laughs> hey, newsflash, newsflash, we're atrocious you, you may look good and you may smell good and you may have enough money to buy deodorant, even some foo-foo juice on you. But listen to me. Let you go without a bath for five days. You would become atrocious. You know that your young person's getting into this adult stage when they could at third grade not take a bath for four days and fifth grade not take a bath for a week and they're okay. But we, would we all agree there comes a point where they raise that arm and you're like, whoo, time for you to take a bath each and every day. You have arrived at adulthood. Amen. And you know, there's something about this morning, I just want to keep pounding over and over and over and over again. That as saved people, we can have a Pharisee attitude that all of a sudden we think to ourselves when we look at the masses of mankind that I'm better than they are. Listen, his pride was not there. He knew he was a sinner among sinners. What does one dirt bag have the right to call another dirt bag a dirt bag? What does one liar have a right to call another liar a liar? Y'all listen to this. Let me catch you on your worst day. And I would think you were an extortioner, an unjust person, and I could call you a publican. But catch me on my worst day, and you'll call me a deacon. No, I'm kidding. And uh, <laughs> there was his pride. And then would you look at verse number 13, and the publican standing afar off would not lift so much as his eyes into heaven, look at this, but smote upon his breast. I find this very interesting, this one action. It was almost as if I don't even like myself. I don't even like me. There are times I don't like me. Can I tell you, if there is not a tear in the corner of your eye for your failing, then you got a Pharisee attitude about your salvation. Could I ask you a question? When is the last time you even said, I'm sorry? I think we live with such this position to where, look at me, look at who I am, look at my position, look at my identity. Let me tell you something this morning, what the world needs is not a pompous, another pompous saved person that thinks they're better than everybody else. This world needs somebody that says, I'm a sinner, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner, and even as a saved person, I don't even like me at times. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? If it happened to the great apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, it should be happening to us each and every day we live. We ought to realize I'm no better than anybody else. He smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then his prayer was one of mercy. When you start looking at the two, man, that hurt. When you start looking at the, <laughs> when you start looking at the two, Good grief, that hurt. And uh, when you start looking at the two, I want to give you several things that I want you to tuck away in your heart. 
First of all, righteous acts do not give you a better standing with God. Oh, please know that. Righteous acts do not give you a better standing with God. Listen to this. You already got the highest standing ever the day you got saved. Did you hear that? You received the highest standing you could ever receive. Do you, do you know, Brother Daniel, could I use you? Would that be okay? We think that our standing with God, and listen to this, it is a works salvation that has infiltrated the average Christian's thinking about God. We think that the more that you get up here, you did this by how you live. I fast twice a week. I give of all my tithes and of all that I possess, which is a good idea. And uh, I, I, give, I, I give, but we think that this, but here's the problem. Do you not and I live that when we don't do this, that now we don't feel as close to God? Here's what the average yo-yo of the life of a Christian is. If I I start doing and performing, and I am a good little boy, and I perform, and I do everything I'm supposed to do, boy, I got a good standing with God. But if I don't do everything I shouldn't do, and let me go weeks without doing what I should do. Listen, if I could get across to everybody here, the day you trusted Jesus Christ was the day that you got a good standing with God, and you became an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It is not a works salvation that gets you to become a son of God, a daughter of God. And it's not a works Christian life that makes you and gives you a better standing with God. Oh, I can hear the Pharisees now. Then why do we do all that we do? There is this righteousness. Thank you very much. This righteous act does not give you a better standing with God. He said this, I fast twice in the week. You know what's really crazy about this is is they were not commanded to fast twice in the week. Y'all listen to this. They were were never commanded to fast twice. Listen to what Zechariah said. And the word of the Lord of hosts, chapter 8, verse 18, came unto me saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace. You know what they were saying? The publicans had, the the Pharisees had come to this juncture after Malachi. You know what they started doing? Let's fast twice in the week. But that's not what the law said. And they thought, no, 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 no. We will do more than what them average people do, and this will give us a bigger standing. Listen to me. Set yourself free today. Because when it's, comes, it, when it's based on performance, then get ready. There's going to be a snobbish attitude that comes with look at everything. You know what COVID did? Listen to this. COVID cleared the plate on your motivation for coming to church. Can I preach a little bit? Because I still got a couple of moments on the clock. COVID cleared the deck on why we come to church. Why? Well, I, I, I come to church, pastor, to play an instrument. That's why I come. COVID cleared that deck. Well, well, pastor, I, I come to church because I sing in the choir. COVID cleared that one. Well, pastor, I, I come to church because I usher. COVID cleared the deck on that one. Do you know why we come to church? We come to church because he saved us, and we come to praise him and to celebrate the fact we're saved. But our value is so wrapped up in that we we fast twice a month. That's what our value is wrapped up in, and we take on this air about us. Look at my resume. Look at everything I do. I must be in a better standing with God. I thank God that I'm not like If you're saved today, you and I are no better than the worst of the worst. Oh, pastor, how can you say that? I can say that with all the confidence of God's word. I want to end with this. Righteousness with humility is how you were exalted. If you look at the wording here, this is, this is amazing. 
Look at Luke 18, verse 14, and I'll end with this. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Which man? The man that said, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know I'm nobody. I I know that that I, I, I need you. I tell you, this man went down to his house, what is it? Justified rather than the other. Listen to this. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be what, please? Exalted. When we read the word exalted with humility, you know where we automatically run to? Prominence. We automatically run to, oh, that means I'll climb the ladder in Christianity and my name will be known everywhere. No. If the context is salvation, Then go to Romans chapter 8, and we'll end with this. He said this, I tell you that this man, Romans chapter 8, you go there. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I'm going to show you, please, that we can live the saved life with an attitude of the publican that we stay humble with our salvation. And that just because I'm saved doesn't make me superior. I must stay humble. I must stay in a mercy needing state. I must stay with my face to the ground knowing that if there's any goodness in me, it did not come because of anything I do. It came because of the wonderful saving power of Jesus Christ. So what is this exalted thing? Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of what, please? Adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we, what, please, are the children of God. Not will become, we are the children of God. Look at this, and if children, then Heirs. Can you say that together, please? And if children, then what? Heirs. Next phrase, heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also, what please, glorified. Ladies and gentlemen, and some people would say, then why do we do all that we do? Pastor. I know Emmanuel's a very conservative church. I know you, Pastor, you're very conservative in your theology and your doctrine and your behavior. Then if it is not the deeds, then why do I need to do? Listen, our righteous acts are a result of salvation. Did you hear that? Because once you and I have trusted Christ and we have abased ourselves no one's going to heaven without coming to the realization you can't save yourself and that you have to abase yourself you have to humble yourself but when you humble yourself and realize I need a savior then he will exalt you if the primary teaching of this passage is salvation then there is no greater exaltation than being an heir with God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And just like you saw me bring Brother Daniel up, this same chapter that talks about becoming an heir and a joint heir, would you go back to the verses before that? Romans chapter 8 and verse number 12. Look at it. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Did you hear that? I want you to look at it, Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the what? Flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall surely die. It doesn't mean you're going to hell. These are written to the believers in the church at Rome. What it means is you'll live a dying life. Look at it. For, but if ye through the what, please? Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are.
the sons of God. This morning, salvation does not make you superior to anybody else. Salvation just makes you blessed. And what salvation does is salvation gives and puts on the inside of you the spirit of the living God. And if we will stay humble, if we will live like we got saved, Galatians 3.3, 3, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect through the flesh? If you and I will stay humble, and we will constantly be coming to the Lord and saying this, Lord, I didn't have it in me to save me. I didn't have it in me to redeem me. And I needed you as my Savior. And right now, Spirit of God, I know I'm an heir, and I know I'm a joint heir, but I want to live like I am an heir. I want to live like I am a joint heir. And you let the Spirit of God lead you. Please, let the Spirit of God God lead you because the same spirit of God that birthed you is the same spirit of God that can lead you and you will walk through this earth being the son of God, being the daughter of God, being an heir, a joint heir. You're not, you're not, you're not even remotely going to hell. You're going to heaven. But God needs an army of believers that they walk through this life with humility, understanding I was undeserving of the grace of God and I am not standing here because I am something. I'm standing here because he is something. Can I ask you a question? Are you a Pharisee? Are you a Pharisee? I have to remind myself on purpose to wash my hands after a Sunday morning. I shake a lot of hands. And I, and I have to remind myself on purpose, Bob, today when we go to lunch, I'll on purpose have to remind myself, Bob, go wash your hands. And I don't even think twice about it. And I think one of the hallmarks of a church that's got it right is a church that is not a snobbish, bigoted, thinking we're better than anybody else. Because we are not. And this world needs a dose of good old-fashioned Christianity that remembers this one thing. I was nothing when he found me. I was nothing when he saved me. And I am still nothing, although I own it all. Do y'all hear that? I am still nothing, although I own it it all please don't be like the pharisee be like the publican stay humble and know this you couldn't save yourself and you don't even know how to lead yourself except the spirit of god question again at any time maybe these past couple of weeks did you look at somebody and there in your heart was that little bit of a publican that you said Thank God I'm not like that. We were coming home one night, and I had Jordan and Deanna in the car, and we were taking a left on McCann off of Highway 80, and this guy stumbled across from us, and he, went to the, he was drunk. He went to the telephone pole, and, and, and he just started beating his head against the telephone pole. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know what he thought it was, and blood was coming down his forehead, and he turned around, and he just kind of slumped down next to the telephone pole, and the kids were young, and, and there was that little bit in me of that Pharisee that I said, oh, I thank God I'm not like him. All of us are susceptible to it if we forget where he saved us from. Thank you for taking the time to view our services. I trust that the sermon, the message, the truth was a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. If I can do anything for you or Emmanuel Baptist could be a blessing to you or yours, please reach out to me, let me know. I also would like to know what God has done in your heart. I would love to rejoice with you. I would love to pray with you. 
I would love to add your prayer request to our Wednesday night prayer bulletin. So if you want to, number's at the bottom of the screen. Text me, let me know. God bless you, and I trust that the Lord will bless your day. Join us again for another broadcast here at Emmanuel Baptist Church.